Hi there, this is John Wilkinson again from History Made Easier. You know, the organisation of the Paris Peace Conference is an important factor to consider. There's the possibility that your exam might have a direct question on the conference's organisation. But knowledge of it could also add a really interesting dimension to an answer to a question on why the work of the conference was so difficult. And it is the purpose of these videos to ensure you earn maximum marks. Now all my ebooks have a series of note frameworks with the purpose of directing your notes towards potential exam questions. And this is the framework for the organization of the Paris Peace Conference. I think you'll easily be able to see its usefulness. Note how I direct the note-taking with questions. Historians first ask questions and then set about trying to answer them. And of course, your exam is going to be full of questions. When the leaders met at Versailles, they had a number of choices to make, and had already made some. And that they had choices is important to the historian, for the choices they made say something about their state of mind. One of the decisions already made was that the conference was to be held in Paris, the capital where emotions were most inflamed and where the cries for revenge were the loudest. It was not a natural choice, though it had been for Clemenceau. Switzerland had been mooted, but the Americans had security concerns. So Paris it was. They had also already decided that the defeated powers were not to be invited to the discussions primarily because they were seen as guilty of causing and extending the war, and so didn't deserve to have a say in the deliberations, whilst it was also felt that they would resist the decisions that were likely to come from the conference, and so would slow things down. At a time when Europe was in chaos, pressures were building, and decisions needed to be made. <laughs> Though as it was, the conference lasted a year before the last of the treaties was signed. Nor was Russia invited to the conference. The second of the two revolutions in Russia in 1917 had made Russia a communist state and had led to the Treaty of Brest-Liptovsk, the treaty between Germany and Russia in 1918, which in turn had led to Russia's withdrawal from the war. So it was no longer considered an ally. Rather, it was considered a threat. The British and French were still assisting those who opposed the communists, the whites, in trying to bring down the Bolshevik government before it could establish a firm grip on power. These are already crucially important decisions that would not only affect the decisions made at the conference in profound ways, but would affect how the defeated powers regarded the treaties. For example, the Germans referred to the Treaty of Versailles with great bitterness as a diktat, a dictated peace, and they had a point. In total, 32 states attended the conference, some of them not yet legally constituted. Just 32 countries might not seem a lot. It was, after all, a world war. But there were a lot fewer independent states back in 1919. And given that they included the world's biggest empires, the British and French empires, the 32 states that did attend represented, and I put represented in inverted commas, represented more than two-thirds of the world's population. 
and 32 states still meant decision-making would be too slow and too cumbersome. An American delegate put it well when he described the opening statements of the Polish and Czech delegations. The head of the Polish delegation, Roman Domowski, began, and I quote the American delegate, began at 11 o'clock in the morning and would reach 1919 and the pressing problems of the moment only as late as 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Edvard Benes for Czechoslovakia, and I'm still quoting the American delegate, began a century earlier and finished an hour later. Think on this next time you think a school assembly is dragging on. Whilst for Britain and France, the treatment of Germany was by far the most important consideration, this was not the case for Italy, which was mostly concerned with securing what had been promised in the Treaty of London, signed in April 1915 nor for the likes of the Romanians, Yugoslavs or Greeks, not even the likes of Czechoslovakia or Poland, though they would have more than a passing interest, and certainly not for Japan, which understandably saw the world from an Asian perspective, whilst America, though aware of how Europe impacts on worldwide matters, was still mostly interested in the bigger picture, these are all important factors because they show the difficulty, we could reasonably say impossibility, of concluding a treaty that would satisfy everyone. And this is ignoring the defeated powers. So it was that the leaders of Britain, France, Italy and America took control and decided to meet with their foreign ministers away from the conference at Versailles, at the Quai d'Ausay, the French Foreign Office. Britain wanted the Japanese to be a part of this smaller forum, and so the Council of Ten was formed. However, no sooner was this done than it was decided that as Japan was not represented by its Prime Minister, it shouldn't, after all, be included. Then the foreign secretaries were felt to be unnecessary, and so the Council of Four was formed. It would become known as the Supreme Council. In reality, though, it was the big three, Clemenceau, Lloyd George and Woodrow Wilson, that met most often and made, and made most of the key decisions. Vittorio Orlando, the Italian Prime Minister, was experiencing political difficulties at home, <laughs> keeping his government in power, and was only really interested in matters that directly concerned Italy. As a result, he missed as many meetings as he attended, and in late April Italy temporarily withdrew over the issue of Fiume. That said... The deliberations of the Big Three were supported by a total of 52 expert commissions, looking into the nitty-gritty of the specific, but nevertheless complex, issues, ranging from responsibility for the war, new borders, reparations, or how to deal with prisoners of war. And in total, there were well over a thousand delegates statesmen and diplomats, but also including the likes of economic experts, intelligence experts, and I have to add, historians. There were breakfast meetings, and a lot of useful work was done over lunch or dinner. But if all this makes the conference appear organised, this wasn't necessarily the case. With each of the big three pursuing their own interests, the discussions often tended to veer from one topic to the next without properly being discussed. Discussions were also at times rushed. And as we've noted, 
they were dealing with incredibly complex issues. Also, all the leaders had their own domestic issues that needed attending to. President Wilson had to return to America for a month. Lord George was, apply, was obliged to attend the House of Commons on more than one occasion. And even Clemenceau on home soil missed sessions. He had a good excuse, though. He was shot and badly wounded in an assassination attempt. Now, the aim of all my work, these YouTube presentations, my website, History Made Easier, and my ebooks on Amazon, are there to try and make top grades in history easier for you to achieve. One of the ways to do this is to consider factors that, though of critical importance, are not always given the consideration they deserve in textbooks. And I think this has been one of those factors. Remember, just a sentence added to an answer can add a mark to your total and so can lift you to a higher grade. I think it's worth the effort on both our parts. You must do too if you're listening to this. So thanks for listening, and don't forget to check out my website. And if you're really intending to aim high, you might want to think about buying my ebooks too. But for now, cheers.